welcome to lesson three on interactions and interdependence. Okay, starting with SC9, use a sampling technique to collect organisms. Okay, so the technique you're meant to use is something called a Talgren funnel, where you collect some leaf litter and put it into a funnel, and then you have a hot lamp above it, and all the creepy crawlies will crawl down into the beaker below. So um, here are the instructions, um, but you probably won't have the equipment at home um, unless your parents happen to have a funnel to do this experiment. So I'm going to show you myself doing it, and then I'm going to give you an alternative that you could try if you want. Okay, so um, I have now set up my Tulgren funnel. So this is called a Tulgren funnel, this setup here. And all you have is you've got a lamp. Now the lamp shines down on here to produce heat. Um, so if I put my hand here, I can actually feel it is really quite warm here. Now the reason that we want heat here is because the kind of um, organisms that are going to be living in this leaf litter are going to be ones that like it damp um, because you can if you sort of feel this it's very sort of damp um, and they like it to be cool and shady and so that's why they live in leaf litter um, so if we make it hot here they're not going to like it and that's going to cause them to crawl down the funnel so this funnel is filled with leaf litter they're going to crawl down the funnel and they're going to fall out the end here and they're going to fall out into uh, you want some kind of glass container or plastic container um, because they won't be able to crawl up the sides of it because it's too slippery. It doesn't matter what that container is. Um, it just needs to be something that they're not going to be able to crawl out of. So we now need to leave this for a good amount of time so that um, anything in here has time to crawl out. Once we've collected everything in here, we can empty this out and put a new um, loading because I collected sort of a couple of batches. Um, and then after that, we can uh, have a look and see what we've got. Okay, so um, obviously you probably won't have all the stuff to put a Tolgren funnel together, um, but what you can do instead is, if you have a, a garden uh, and you have a trowel or something to dig with, and then um, I'm using a glass, um, but you could use Tupperware, um, you could use an empty yogurt pot, an empty jar, um, make sure you ask your parents for something that they don't mind you uh, putting in the garden but um, just something that again has slippery sides that the um, creeper crawlies can't get out of um, so yeah yogurt pot is is ideal but um, any empty container okay and then what you need to do is you need to uh, dig a hole for your um, for your container to go into now again you need to check um, that um, that you're digging somewhere that your parents are happy with. Actually, thinking about this, I don't think Mr. Lally's going to be very happy with me digging a hole here. Where will he not mind me dig digging a hole? Hmm. Maybe. Maybe around here. Yes, maybe here. Okay, so um, once you've found a, a good spot that you won't get in trouble making a hole in, you need to uh, dig dig the hole, um, which is easier said than done with one hand. So you might have to <laughs> keep looking around for somewhere soft enough. Um, I'm going to try and find another spot because I can't seem to dig there at all. What's this bit? Ah, yes, this is nice and soft. Probably because it's a flower bed. Okay, so once you've got a hole that's about the right... So once you've got a hole that's about the right depth, put your container in. You want to make sure that you fill kind of the sides up. And then... It's quite a good idea to have like a few bits going over the top, although they mustn't go in like that, because you're more likely to get um, things falling in if you've got like a bit of a, bit of a 
sort of bridge going on so that's that's quite good like that um so what what you then do is you, you leave it for um a, a couple of days however if it rains anything in there's going to drown so you must make sure that you um empty it out straight away if that's the case um otherwise yeah you're just going to have some dead bugs in there so maybe wait for the nice weather um to come and then and then uh bury it um and yeah, as I say, we can now leave that for a couple of days, come back and check out what's going on inside. So once you've collected some bugs through either of the methods shown, uh, you need to identify them using this pictorial key. So you just follow the questions to identify whatever it is that you're looking at. So as well as identifying the organisms that you hopefully found, I'd also like you to identify the ones in the table. Um, this is also great for if you didn't find anything or you weren't able to do the practical part. Um, so pause here and identify the six organisms in the table. Remember to use the key. The answers on the top row from left to right are centipede, harvest man and earthworm, worm would be fine. And the answers on the bottom row from left to right are um, earwig, aphid and woodlouse. Moving on to SC10, investigate a food chain in a local habitat. For this task, you need to research the organisms that you found, or the ones from the table, the commonly found ones, to find out which ones are herbivores, uh, omnivores, or carnivores. Um, and then you need to create a food chain. It can be a really, really simple food chain, uh, but it has to include the organisms um, from that table or the organisms you found. Okay, so I'm just going to talk through how you might want to have drawn your um, food chain. So you needed to start with leaf litter. So I'm just going to draw a single leaf um, and then label it leaf litter. Um, now the other label that you would want here is producer because of course leaves are plants. So producer. Then we need an arrow to show the direction of the flow of energy. And then you could really have chosen uh, anything from the table except for the harvestman. So you could have chosen the earwig, the aphid, the worm, the uh, centipede, um, and I think there was one more thing on the table. So anything except for, oh yeah, the woodlouse. So anything except for the harvestman. So I'm going to draw the woodlouse. Your pictures don't have to be uh, amazing. Simple pictures are fine. Um, Okay, so there's my woodlouse, so I'm going to label him woodlouse. And then um, he is my primary consumer because he's the first level um, after the producer. Okay, and then you only need uh, one more thing. So um, in the examples you were given um, from that table, the only sort of apex predator that we had there really was the harvestman, um, which is um, kind of a uh, spider with very long legs, basically. Um, so I'm going to do him here with his very long legs. <laughs> this is a terrible picture, guys. Um, and that's fine. We're not in an art lesson. We're in science. So there we go. There is my harvestman. Good thing for labels. Harvestman. 
and he is my uh, secondary cons consumer or also um, my apex predator in this particular food chain. But of course, um, in a food web, he certainly wouldn't be the apex predator. There'd be plenty of birds and small mammals that would eat him. Um, so I could also put secondary consumer. So what we're really looking for to get the marks are that your arrows are in the right direction, that you have got a producer, that you've got a primary consumer and you've got a secondary consumer and um, that you've chosen something that will actually eat something else. So make sure that you actually did do your research and find out that a harvestman will eat uh, wood lice and aphids and beetles and all kinds of other um, little creepy crawlies. Okay. On to SC11, which is to explain predator-prey relationships. Predator and prey populations are hugely dependent on one another. The population of a predator is reliant on how many prey are available for it to eat. The more prey there are, the more likely it is that they will be successful in their hunting. The population of their prey are also reliant on the population of the predator. This is because if there are a lot of predators around, the prey are more likely to be caught and eaten. However, if there are very low numbers of predators, then they have a better survival rate. This means that if you increase the population of prey, the predator population will also increase. However, once it has increased, our prey population will start to decrease. This results in the populations continually cycling up and down, up and down, as the other one cycles up and down. See if you can now uh, use what you've learnt and apply it to the questions in SC11. Okay, if you pause on this screen, you can then uh, mark your answers to SC11. They should be pretty easy. And so the last thing is to go on to SC12, which is to list the limiting factors on populations. You can see in this table here that I've written the six things that can limit the population of a particular species. All you have to do is draw a simple picture to illustrate that factor. Um, I would like you to colour them in, please. Please upload SC12 to Shobi. You need to upload it into week two and the um, assignment is called Limiting Factors Comic Strip. And that is lesson three completed. Well done, guys.